So, you know, I think we'll do it now. Sounds like looks awfully quiet right now. So again, uh, welcome to today's webinar. This webinar is uh, focused on frequently asked questions. These questions mainly have come from the RA account. Uh, you'll meet Amy in a few moments. Uh, Amy is the one who monitors and responds in the RA account. Amy has likely responded to hundreds of questions and sort of she sort of put together, these are the commonly asked questions that perhaps need some clarification. So that's um, what we're doing today. This is the third in a series of our Act 13 trainings. And upon the conclusion of this particular session, we'll be posting both the PowerPoints and the recording of the webinar, although quite frankly, the recording might take a little bit longer because we've got to do some closed captioning and make sure it's ADA compliant. But both of those pieces will be on uh, the SAS site educator effectiveness tab. And we have a subheading under that educator effectiveness labeled simply recorded session. So you'll be able to access uh, these there. So once again, we welcome you. I am Jean Dysel. I'm from the Bureau of Curriculum Assessment and Instruction and a member of the educator effectiveness uh, core work team, if you will. Our expert presenter today is Amy Lena. Amy is a division chief in the Bureau of School Support and I'm also pleased to sort of welcome to our audience, if you will, Carrie Rowe. Carrie is the newly appointed director of the Bureau of School Support. So if you're with us, Carrie, uh, we welcome you and uh, you can give us a little wave. Um, so good to have you with us. That said, Amy, let's move to the next slide because we've got lots of good news to share today. Uh, so once again, our program today is going to address those frequently asked questions that have been recurring over time, as I said, in the RA account and in the previous sessions that we've had the online webinars. What we're doing today is sort of an interesting, uh, I don't want to say we're giving you a test, but we're presenting some information. We're having you explore the interactive toolkit. I'll be dropping in the link in just a few moments to the site. You can, if you want to open the toolkit, and then we will be presenting uh, some scenarios to you where you'll have to go in and use the toolkit to respond. So once again, we'll be posting this PowerPoint and the actual recording of this session on the SAS website under the Educator Effectiveness tab. And again, we have a sub tab called Recorded, uh, uh, recorded Trainings. Alrighty. So uh, Amy put together this lovely slide on office hour etiquette. You are all muted, and because of the, there are only 30 plus of you on now, but typically we have uh, larger numbers. But to keep this manageable and to make sure we get through the entire session, we're just asking these sort of three simple requests. One of which is listen to the presenter, and you're welcome to enter questions as much as possible. Try to keep your questions on target of what Amy might be presenting. In every session that we've had so far, we'll get a question and the person will, I'll say, just hold on, we'll be getting to it the next slide or something of that nature. So just try to keep yourself on, to on topic and we'll get through everything. On the other hand, if we get to a pause point and you haven't addressed, we haven't addressed what you're interested in, please feel free to enter in the chat and we will follow up with you. If it's a question I can respond with um, an answer in the chat, I'll do that or refer to Amy and she'll give you um, absolute good direction. And also I ask that you monitor the chat for responses. Very often you'll find that a question you might be asking, someone else has already asked it. So to avoid that sort of redundancy, just keep your eye on the chat, look at what's there, take a look and see if it's something that was a, a burning question, if you will, for you as well. So Amy, I think you are ready to put your show on the road. I am going to drop into the chat the access to the EE website, the Educator Effectives website on SAS. You'll go to that site. Once you get there, and we'll pause for a second or two, you'll see the whole list of all the good things we have there for you. And then there is a, a tab, a sub tab, where you can open Educator Effectiveness. And there are two toolkits there, which Amy will describe a PDF and an interactive version. All righty, Amy, I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Jean. Welcome everybody. We appreciate you joining us for these FAQs. And the very first one we're gonna begin with is the number one question since beginning of rolling out Act 13. 
So it's a temporary professional employee. So the definition is at the top of this slide. Um, as you can see that it is for any individual who has been employed to perform for a limited time, the duties of a newly created position or of a regular pro professional employee whose services have been terminated by death, re resignation, suspension, or removal. This definition has not changed um, since Act 82. What is different with temporary professional employees is the way we measure to evaluate the TPEs, not the actual definition. So while the definition does not address tenure explicitly, common, Commonwealth case law has held the distinction between a professional employee and a temporary professional employee that is the former has secured tenure. So meaning a temporary professional employee would be a non-tenured employee. Along with that, we have the requirements of the level one certificate versus the level two to get to the level two certificate. To gain um, the level two certificate, there are certain requirements. One of the requirements is that the um, educator must be evaluated six times semi-annually. So for the basically the first three years of employment, they would be observed twice a year. Act 13 explicitly says that professional employees are rated once a year and temporary professional employees are rated twice a year. With that written into the law, that means those people who are being rated semi-annually must be TPEs. The only exception for a professional employee to be rated semi-annually is if they were unsatisfactory the previous evaluation. So if they were rated unsatisfactory at the end of last year, an LEA could choose to rate that, that professional employee a second time. Otherwise, if you're rating them twice a year, therefore they are temporary and empl professional employees. Now, at, remember the definition hasn't changed, but the measure which they are evaluated has changed. So with Act 13, we have 100% observation and practice. You'll notice the absence of building level score, LEA selected measures, and also teacher specific data. So regardless of their assignment, if they are a TPE, this is their evaluation. So to help us really um, understand this, we've, our next slide is gonna offer some scenarios. We'll give you time to think through the scenarios and then ask you to place your answers in the chat. So let's go begin with scenario number one. Teacher A is a 15 year veteran with a level two certificate and is working in your district as a long-term substitute for the full year. Is teacher A a TPE or a PE? Feel free to, and once you have thought about it, feel free to put, drop your answer into the chat. Anyone else want to take a guess? There's some more. All right. I'll give you 30 more seconds to drop your answer in. All right, the answer for this one is either TPE or PE. This would be dependent on the LEA's policy. So this is one of the gray areas where you would wanna to talk to your solicitor 
And as an LEA, make a decision on how you're defining TPE with someone in this situation. Okay, so this is a, so you all are right, depending on how your LEA defines it. Let's go to scenario number two. Teacher B is a second year contracted teacher with a level one certificate. Is teacher B a TPE or a PE? Go ahead and drop your answer into the chat when you're ready. Second year contracted teacher with a level one cert. Thank you for all that you answered. Awesome. All right, you all are correct. Teacher B is a TP. This is not a gray area. They're in their second year and they're being observed, um, observed many, as many times as they want and evaluated twice a year. Therefore, they are a TPE. Very good. Any questions about TPEs that anyone wants to throw in the chat, now is a great time. And I'll have Jean share with me what they are. Amy, while we're waiting for the chat, just to clarify, going back to teacher A, teacher A is obviously a substitute teacher. If teacher A had received tenure in a, a prior work life, so we, we're harking back to Commonwealth law that defines uh, the, the notion of tenure with a TPE, because that individual has had tenure in a prior district, can we call them a TPE in the long-term substitute position? We can. Thank you. Do we have any questions? I'll clarify about teacher B. If teacher B were in the fourth year of teaching, but not had received their level two, they could be a TPE or a PE. It would be because they would be finished their semi-annual evaluations. So it would be up to the LA to make that decision. Any questions, Jean? I don't see anything. Thank you, Amy. Okay, great. All right, let's go into our three classifications of educators under Act 13. We have the classroom teacher who provides direct instruction to students related to a specific subject or grade level. We have the non-teaching professional who provides services other than classroom instruction. And we have some examples listed below. We have these frameworks available on SAS, but the biggest bucket that's really most of your NTPs, and we couldn't name all of them because there are so many job titles that are naming the same role, but slightly different title. So therefore the, the biggest bucket would be other. We really are pushing you to check out that other framework because it's going to be, you can be tailored to the person who you are evaluating. And that's where most NTPs are gonna fall under that other category. And then finally, we have the principal. The principal includes, obviously that makes sense, the building principal and the assistant vice principal. It also includes the director of career and technical education. And then new with Act 13, the supervisor of special ed. Once again, you may have different job titles for supervisors of special ed. It's really about the job description. Are they supervising that special ed department? And th therefore they would fall under this principal category. So let's look at some scenarios. The next slide will offer some scenarios and we'll give you time to think through these and then ask you to put your answers in the chat. So the first one is an occupational therapist, physical therapist. The individual is a licensed OTPT and works full time across the district. What category is used to evaluate the therapist? If you don't mind putting in the chat. So the individual is a licensed OTPT. Can I give them a hint, Amy? You can, you can. 
This individual is licensed, not certificated by the Department of Education. Now, do you have a different answer? <laughs> Dina, thank you. <laughs> Good, Thomas, I like your answer. <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so this is a, not a certificated employee, therefore does not fall under Act 13, not reportable. So LEAs are currently filling out the Educator Effectiveness Annual Report. This person is not reportable. Um, you, you're, you can choose to use whatever the district determines appropriate. Um, framework for observation and practice, other of NTP may be great for an observation instrument. However, this person does not fall under Act 13 because they are licensed and not certificated. Another example would be a behavior analyst. If licensed but not certificated, then they also do not fall under, fall under Act 13. So let's look at B, second scenario, social worker. This is an individual is licensed and certificated and works full time across the district. What category is used to evaluate the social worker? There you go, perfect. Yep. And that is the key word that was just called out, certificated. So it, this is an NTP. And I'm going to give you their brand new um, certificated position. So that is, um, you know, why we wanted to bring it up. I want to also give you one more example that's not on here. What if we have a coach who teaches um, a direct instruction class one period a day, and the rest of the day su does support of students and of teachers. What would this instructional coach fall under? Okay, we have one answer, okay. Thomas, what do you mean by both? Okay, right, yes. And Ron says it perfectly. It's a local decision, Dan did too. So it's, yes, and Thomas, you're right. It's local decision because there is that teaching. So you might, you wanna look at the job description and say, are we going to, place this person as an NTP or a classroom teacher. It really should be decided with the solicitor and be a broad um, decision across the school district or IU or any LEA, okay? Any questions about these categories before we move on? I'll let Jean share if there are any questions. Nothing in the chat, Amy, thank you. Okay. Our next topic, this is topics we're gonna to look into the interactive toolkit, the link that uh, Jean shared at the beginning for the definitions of data available and non-data available. So if you go to the site that Jean is um, sharing and you click on the Educator in Effectiveness Interactive Toolkit, it comes up. You can find some information under two places under evaluation measures, but you can also find these under references and definitions and terms. So can, I'm gonna go back to my slide. So that's where you would find it if you have two screens and you can pull it up. We're gonna, our first question is about the data available. So can someone drop in the chat the definition of a data available teacher? There you go, Laurie, and I think someone else, Heather, okay, right. 
That's right. Very good. The key is this educator is teaching a subject that is assessed by the PSSAs or Keystones. Very good, well done. Now I'm gonna ask everyone to participate and can please list, identify three positions in your building or LEA who will be classified as a data available classroom teacher and add it to the chat. Good, Dina. Mm -hmm. Yes, Clay, yep. Mm -hmm. You guys are good at diversifying it too. Yeah. Right, Tracy, correct. Now, one question I did see um, or label was the special education. Mm -hmm. The special edu education teacher could be a data available, but they also could not be. So special education teachers are data available teachers if they're teaching a PSSA tested subject or a Keystone tested subject, either as a pullout and they're the only teacher of record or if they are co-teaching. So if they are co-teaching, a PSSA tested subject or a Keystone tested subject, meaning when I say co-teaching, meaning they present, they plan, and they grade, just as the other person they're teaching with does, then they are data available. If they're only offering support, they are not data available. So special ed could go either way, and most special ed teachers will not be data available. Amy, I also noticed that uh, several folks, uh, Mike and Yashira, indicate uh, such things as grade eight math, uh, biology, and so on. But then we also have ELA and science. And maybe we want to clarify, they are teaching in core content, but are ELA and science teachers, all of them, part of data available? Okay, yeah, I read her answer is grade eight math, grade eight ELA, and grade eight uh, science, but that's a good question, yeah. So if they are um, an ELA teacher in 11th or 12th grade where it's not a keystone subject, they are not data available. And that's what it's leading right into the perfect segue into my next question for you to find in the interactive toolkit. What is a non-data available classroom teacher? So if I can ask you to go to that toolkit again and find that answer, and if someone could drop it into the chat, that would be great. And Tracy said it perfectly, <laughs> very good. And thank you, Tracy. That is exactly it. A classroom teacher teaching a content area, not assessed. So just as we did with data, please identify three positions in your building or LEA that are non-data available classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how you specifically said science seventh. That's great. You guys have this. This is wonderful. Great. Yeah, excellent. So let's look at this teacher specific data. Now that we've really put my, wrapped our minds around the data versus non-data, let's go into how the teacher specific data is um, calculated for these cl um, classroom teachers. So we can, as you can see, there are three buckets, so to speak. That's how I refer to them. We have the first one, which is three measures available and directly attributable. So we have state assessments at two and a half percent. We have PBOS, which is 
and IEP goals progress, which is two and a half percent. Unlike Act 82, these percentages are not a sliding scale. They are set. So if we have three measures, this is the breakdown. If we have two measures, you can see that they're 5% each. And if you have one measure, it's 10%. So in the fall, this school year, 21-22, there will be building level data and teacher specific data. So that is different than last year, 2020 to 2021. There is no data coming because that was waived. So therefore, teacher evals were, did not have that included. But in the fall of 2022, so just like we did pre-pandemic, we released this, these um, data points in the fall. So in the fall of 2022, the department will make available the school year assessment data for teacher-specific data attribution. However, growth data will not be made available for this school year or next school year. It'll be made available the following school year because you need a three-year rolling average. So in the fall of 2024 will be the first time that we see that growth, that PVAS score. So looking at that first bucket, no teacher will be in that bucket this school year or next school year. Okay, it will not be till the fall of 2024 where we could possibly have someone there. So we're really looking at the last two. We have two measures, which could be if I am a data available teacher, AKA have a um, PSSA or Keystone attributed to me, and I meet the end count for IEP goals progress, I would fall into that second or middle bucket there where I have two measures and they're 5% each. And we're gonna dive into IEP goals progress. So hold those questions for a minute, but let's just say that you do meet the end count and you do have a state assessment, you're at 5% each. The last bucket's reserved for anyone, so a, a data available teacher who did not meet the end count would have 10% achievement or there's a state assessment score as part of their evaluation. Or a non-data available teacher who does meet the end count for IEP goals progress would also have 10% part of their evaluation. You will most likely have several employees or educators who do not meet the end count and do not have a state assessment assigned to them. Therefore, if you look at the bottom box there, they will then have that 10% reallocated to the LEA selected measure, which will now be 20% of their evaluation. So you're looking at the last two, we have this two if you're a data available, and the last one is data available with only assessment or non-data available with only IEP goals progress. Questions before we dive into IEP goals progress? Nothing in the chat, Amy, thank you. Okay. So let's look at this IEP goals progress. Is this something that we can waive? Um, just you know, look look away. No, we cannot because all classroom teachers shall be accountable for student progress toward IEP goals. So regardless of their certification area, if they meet the following, so the IEP goals progress measure is required under the Individuals with Disability Education Act. If now you have to meet these two things. The teacher provides instruction to a sufficient number of students with IEPs, meaning you meet the end count. And those students have similar academic or non-academic, which sometimes you'll hear us refer as behavioral, IEP goals to which the teacher contributes. In other words, if I have a bunch of students and they're all their IEP goals are different, then I do not have a group of students who have similar goals. Okay, so that's where that is important. So what do we mean by end count? The end count must be set at less than or equal to 11. So the LEA must come together with their solicitor and say, here is what our end count is. We set it. We say, okay, I'm going to set it at 11 because that's what PVOS does and that's what we're going to keep it at. You can go zero through 11 is what you can set it at. So if they set it at 11, that means classroom teachers look at their rosters, 
and they say, I have 11 or more students with similar goals, then I meet the end count. That's step one, determining the end count. I know a school, an LEA that has an end count of three. Okay, so it's all over the board for across the state. An active end count based on the portion of instructional responsibility may be used rather than the actual end count. So this is slightly different. This is decision number two for the LEA. Are we using active or actual? Active means, let's, I'm gonna give you an example. So I have, look at my students and I have 15 students with um, similar goals. Similar, we'll say academic this time. I usually say behavioral. 15 academic goals that are very similar. And I say, okay, is the district using actual or, en or active? If they're using actual, I definitely need the end count, regardless of what it's set. If I say active, I go, okay, what did my district set it at? They set it at 11, okay. What is my active? How much is my responsibility toward those goals? Oh, I give 50%, I count 50% of my responsibility toward the goals. Therefore, seven, when I take 50% times my 15, I get 7.5. I no longer have meet the end count. So if my LEA is using active end count, I do not do IEP goals progress. Finally, the end count should apply to a grade level cohort or correlate to all students within a subject area. If I'm an algebra one teacher and I teach five periods a day, I look over all five periods of my algebra one class and say, do I meet that end count? All right, we're gonna give you a scenario. I am a math teacher who instructs 12 students with the IEPs. My LEA has set the end count at 10. Okay, now let's look at the IEPs. Students have, these 12 students have similar behavior goals, but my responsibility is 25% instructional responsibility for each of the 12 students. So, Question number one, what is the actual end count? Please drop that into the chat. Careful, we want the actual end count. So how many? actual students do I have? Good, yep, good. Yeah, very good. Excellent, good job. So now you probably know what my next question is. Some of you are anticipating it. What is my active end count? Yeah, so you take that 25%, multiply it by 12, and you have three. So my last question is, let's see if you can get this one. Is the math teacher responsible for IEP goals progress? Think about, this is like a word problem that has missing information. <laughs> Did I tell you if the LEA has set actual or um, active yet? Right, there you go. If the district uses actual, then it's yes. If the district uses active or the LEA uses active, then it's no. Because my LEA set the end count at 10. So it's under, if it's active, it's under the end count. If it's actual, it's above the end count. Amy? Yes. Tracy put in, I think, a really good question. She said, I thought the TPE needed to have input into the goal as well as meet the requirement for IEP goals progress. Uh, so you want to chat about that? 
thinking about what the evaluation of, of a TPE is versus providing input to the IEP team. Yep. So while the TPE will definitely provide input, they will not be evaluated on the IEP goals progress because their evaluation is 100% observation and practice as a TPE. Just as um, a brand new English teacher, eighth grade English teacher will not have that achievement score or growth score attributed to them until they're no longer a TPE. So TPEs are always 100% evaluation and practice. Observation and practice. Yes, yeah, sorry, thank you. Is that okay. can't... wait? My instructors do not. So right, if your instructors do not contribute data to an IEP goal, they would not do IEP goals progress. Correct. It's contributing the data. Okay, Jean. Let me know if anything else comes through. We'll go to the billing level. We'll do. Thank you. So building level data is a data point that will be associated with anyone in the building who receives a building level score, except for a few exceptions, which we will talk about momentarily. So let's talk about the majority right now. Um, so Act 82 is 15%, and you can see on this slide what was included in the building level data. In Act 13, it's 10%, and there are less things included. Um, we have the achievement, the growth, the attendance, the graduation, and then the challenge multiplier, which is new, is adjusted based on the economically disadvantaged student population. So how is this building level score, um, what it's, what's it based on? So it's based on a 100 point scale. So if I'm a typical high school where I have ELA, math and science, and we're giving the keystones and people are graduating, then this is what it would look like. It's out of a hundred points. That's a typical high school in the state. So we have the achievement, we have the growth, and then we have attendance and graduation. Let's move to the typical middle school, six through eight. Once again, they're gonna have ELA math and science tests and they're gonna have that growth, but they're not gonna have a graduation rate. So absent a graduation rate, their attendance rate is 20 points. So it's still out of 100 points, but they're no longer counting graduation. What if I have a K to three school? They're not gonna have in that achievement bucket, they're not gonna have that science score because that's a fourth grade test. In the academic growth, they're not gonna have growth because they're third grade. So that whole middle section will be gone. And then the last section, they're not gonna have graduation, but they'll have attendance. So that's still 20 points. So their um, 100 point scale is then reduced to 50 points, okay? So that's where that comes in. Now, what if you're a K to two? What if you're a part-time CTC with no academics? You will not receive a building score. So you're one of the exceptions. I'm giving you a hint to one of our answers coming up. Okay, you are, do not have a building score, therefore that's not part of the evaluation. But the people that do receive a building score, everyone in that building receives that score. Whether they're a kindergarten teacher, if they're in a K-5 to building, they're receiving that score. Okay, so let's do some scenarios with building level data. You're gonna go back to this toolkit and Jean can tell you where, I just wanted to point it out. Go back to your toolkit. Which employees, let's talk, these are the exceptions. Which employees do not receive a building level score as part of their evaluation or could not receive it? There's, I'll give you a hint. There's four answers. Let's see if we can get them. And it's in the toolkit. I'll give you a hint where it is here. Um, yep, under building level data. And if you scroll down to the bottom of that, you will see some answers being given to you.
I can share my screen too if anyone's having trouble finding it. Very good. TPE is one. So we have one. We need three more. Oh, yeah. TP and TP as well. Yep. Absolutely. There's another answer on my screen too. And then I gave you one in the previous slide an answer. We'll come back to your question about the IEP goals progress. I just want to see if we can get, does anyone have another answer? It's right in this toolkit here. Let's see if we can get a couple of answers. We have TPE for sure. I can give you the answer, but I was hoping you'd find it. I think we have test fatigue, Amy. <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, very good. T Thomas, thank you. Teachers in a primary grade, right. If they're in a K to two, very good. Um, supervisor of special ed, if they, um, they're, it, yeah, they're not assigned to a building. Okay. Yep. Half time CTC. So, right. So, right. If you're not in a building that receives a score, you're not, um, and you're a TP and then right in here on my screen, it talks about if you are not assigned a building or if you're not employed by the school the LEA. So if you're an IU employee working in a school building, you're not an employee of the LEA. Therefore, you would not receive the building score, even though you report there every day. And then the uh, next one is the transfer option. So if you can go to this transfer option here, this is what we're going to talk about next. What measures may be substituted? So if someone is transferring buildings, during their first two years, they have the option of not having the building level score used in their evaluation. This is something you would set up at the beginning of the year saying this is the route we wanted to go. Um, the person being evaluated would talk to their evaluator and they would say, I'm brand new to this building. I just transferred from building A and now I'm in building B. I shouldn't receive this building level score that during their first two years there, they can have an alternate form of um, part of their component of their evaluation. It's right here in our toolkit. So as you can see, hopefully you can see this and I can blow it up. We have classroom teachers, non-teaching professionals and principal can then have that 10% put into their observation and practice score. Classroom teachers and non-teaching professionals can have it as an LEA selected measure. Typically an NTP does not have um, an LEA selected measure, but they can if they're transferring. The classroom teacher can elect to have it as part of their teacher specific data. And a principal or anyone that falls in that principal category can have it added to their performance goals. So this would be a substitution as an exception if you are transferred. And I do wanna go back to that one question that I, I didn't, um, so math is math. If a teacher has an overall of 13 students with IEPs and 12 of those have behavioral goals that, and we'll say similar, that the evaluation will include progress on IEP goals, that is correct. Even if different subjects within a con, oh, I see. So if, right, I was doing a generic math. So. Jean, do you want to touch upon that too? Like if if I'm an, if I teach algebra one and algebra two? Yeah, I think I responded up above on that because okay. uh, if I had, if I were, I'll use English teacher instead because that's what I know better. Mm -hmm. um, maybe I taught uh, you know uh, various grade levels of English. So they're different courses, just like having algebra or geometry or calculus or anything of that nature. If there happen to be 
academic or behavioral goal that would span across all that I teach, they are similar, then I believe depending on your end count and how many students you have, there would be that opportunity for IEP goals progress. And just to say, um, as Kay Pinter says, IEPs and 12 of those have behavior goals. Um, remember that they need to be similar goals. We, we can't have a range of disparate goals, but if they're all on, you know, um, uh, being on time, completing work, things of that nature, it could span across different subject areas. I think this is an area that with 82 has been grossly neglected, but I think it's something you need to put your attention to. And Amy, you've done a great job in going through the toolkit here, but it would really behoove all of us to go back and read through that whole IEP goals progress and the actual count and the active count and what counts and what doesn't and, and just make some good decisions within your, within your LEA. Okay, thank you. And while I've interrupted here, <laughs> um, Larry asked a good question and I'm not familiar enough with PIMS to be able to know this. So I'm a grade 10 English teacher, which is the keystone year in my district. And I'm, I'm brand spanking new and I've been teaching for, you know, as a TPE because I'm new. Um, do we not record, I don't know the answer to this, do we not record their achievement and growth, even though we don't use it because you're 100% observation and practice, do we need to wait another three years before that, that new teacher has accumulated the three years for PVAS growth? And I, I don't know the answer, so I'm, I'm throwing that out to you, Amy. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, it's not recorded in your evaluation, but certainly the school would be have that data. And, you know, I definitely worked with my teachers regardless if it was part of their evaluation or not. And, you know, we had meetings about it. And, and so you can have them set informal goals, but it's not part of their evaluation. And but as far as... As far as PIMS, is it part of the roster verification process? Um, well, yeah, but there, so the it is part of the, they're, well, they're, yeah, they're accounted for on the roster verification, but they're not, that's never going to be part of their evaluation. Yes, correct. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, I would say that yes for TPEs to do that. Yeah, there um, is and then, go ahead, sorry, Gene, I'm going to let you handle it. Uh, um, I'm just reading one more question here. Kay Pinter says, transferring teacher from out of the district, but tenured in Pennsylvania, the local decision is whether to have them a TPE. I think that harkens back to some things we've talked about earlier. Yes, it would be for the first, I mean, I don't know that you keep them TPEs probably for more than one year, but absolutely you can make them a TPE if they're new to your district. And that would be an LEA decision. Correct. It's something that you you know you would set as the LEA. Hey, all new all brand new teachers are going to to us are going to be TPEs. Absolutely. Thank you. I think we've captured. Uh, Great. All right. Good. We're we're making good progress here. I want to get um. So let's look at our um, professional de development requirements. Temporary professionals um, must complete Act 13 training during probation, probationary period. So sometime while they're that temporary professional, they must have Act 13 training. Anyone in the principal category must complete Act 13 training with the PIL course within the first six months of appointment, meaning that they're new to the principal role. So if I was a building assistant for several years, or even a year ago I was, but this year I'm an, now the head principal, or now I'm the director of the CTC, then I'm not you know, I don't, it's not required of me, but I can still attend. So it's new. The exception would be the special ed supervisor, although they fall into the principal role for evaluation purposes, they do not receive Act 45. So therefore, they can take the PIL course for Act 48 hours, or they can take the SAS five-hour course that's meant for them in substitution. They're the only new to that position that can do a substitution. Schools must incorporate Act 13 training into the induction program. So if temporary professional employees are your new teachers, most likely they're just gonna have the training in the induction program. It's also included in your comprehensive plan, which is in the Future Ready Comprehensive Planning Portal. 
Okay, so that must be included in that. And then professional employees, the rest of your educators must complete a condensed Act 13 training of the program every seven years. This can be LEA design, or you can use one of the trainings we have available on SAS or the ones from IU3. So we have a scenario, I know we're, I just wanna make sure everyone's knowing, I promise it's only a few here. Assistant principal in 2020, 2020 to 2021, um, principal A was promoted to a building level principal this year, is principal A required to take the Act 13 pill course? Yes or no? Have anyone? <laughs> I know it's the end of the day. Yes, they, um, right. Okay, yeah, I see yes, I see no. It is correct. Heather is correct. No, it is, they're not required because they were in the principal role last year as an assistant principal. So therefore they are not required, but it's a great course. So I highly recommend it, but they're not required to take it. Um, when are professional employees? This has been a big question coming into the RA. That's kind of why I made it a scenario. When are professional employees required to take the Act 13 training? And Mike, you're right. Um, if they did the training, that's fine. But people that were um, in the principal role prior to this year wouldn't have had the opportunity to take the training, but they're, so they're still not required to take it. So professional employees, so most of your staff are required what type of training? Does anyone remember? Yeah, right, very good, Tracy, it's every seven years. Yeah, good, thank you. And I can give you this one, the training available um, for the director um, is for a director or supervisor of special education would be, um, they can take the pill course and receive Act 48 for it, or they could take the five hour SAS course. So we have a waiting form session coming up um, it is going to be in two weeks and um, three weeks, sorry. And, but it's coming up soon. And it's currently available on SAS are the 13-1 TPEs, 13-2, 13-3 TPEs, and 13-4. Those are the ones you should be using for mid-year. Coming soon because they're going through legal and ADA compliance, but will be up soon are the 13-1s and the 13-3s. Peers will have all rating forms available by the end of the year for end of year evaluations. So it will be all updated. The 13-4 is um, been receiving a lot of questions. So this is for professional employees deemed unsatisfactory in the last evaluation. They must be rated at least once a year because they're a professional employee using measures and weightings appropriate to the employee. And, but subsequent ratings during the same evaluation period are not mandated. However, should an LEA elect to perform one, the interim evaluation must be completed of the following, 70% observation and practice and 30% LEA selected measures. This holds true regardless of their role. So NTPs do not typically have LEA selected measures but they would if they had been rated unsatisfactory and you choose to use the 13-4. So you may, um, performance goals can be used for principals instead of LA select measure. But if you have a counselor, for instance, you can use a measure for their LEA select measure that would be pertinent to their role, such as student career readiness portfolios. So you could, but they will have that 30%. You cannot skip it on the form. That's been a question. So I wanted to make sure you knew. So if counselor A received an unsatisfactory rating at the conclusion of last year, what mid-year rating obligation exists? Do you have to rate them is what the question really means. And what LEA selected measure is applicable? So anyone know if you, do you have to rate someone mid-year if they're unsatisfactory the year before? I appreciate, thank you guys for putting in. The answer is actually no. 
you don't have to rate them, but if you do, you would use a 13-4. Okay, that's up to you. You can observe them as many times as you want, but you, so like for needs improvement, if their needs improvement, they need to be on improvement plan. So you would observe them more than once, but a needs improvement is still considered satisfactory. So therefore they would be evaluated once. But and the exception to un, um, rating twice a year would be the unsatisfactory can be rated twice a year. And anyone who's rated needs improvement twice within the last four years can also have a mid-year rating. But none of that is um, obligatory. It's just that you may do it. When I say what LEA selected measure is applicable, you can use um, the SPM template or another format that meets that 30% requirement, but it is required part of the 13 form. So we're at the top of the hour. Um, what's next? So coming up next week, we have the student performance measures slash performance templates. So there are the three we're gonna discuss on February 9th, 12 and three o'clock. We hope you can make it, but if you can't, it will be recorded. And as always, please feel free to reach out to us. We have, of course, the PDE site. We really are directing everyone to this educator effectiveness site here because it's a one-stop shop. But also you can reach out with your questions to the RA and I'm happy to answer them for you. And here's the RA email. We can't thank you enough for spending your afternoon with us and we hope that we see you in a future session.